we're good, guys. We're good. Hey, we're going to get right in the Word tonight, and um, I'll probably end up preaching to you, but it is kind of teachy. I want to attempt to finish a message that has deeply impacted my life and impacted many of yours also. It's called Avoiding the Bitter Root Road, and we didn't get through it, but we're going to attempt to get through it. A quick review as God helps me. And so are you ready? How many of you were here for the message when we preached it but didn't finish? Yeah, because it was just like we just ran out of time. And, and I, uh, you know why we have to, some say, well, you should never have a time on a church. That's nonsense. No, time's, time's important. You, you, if, you go, if you go long, you know, if Jesus shows up and lays hands on everybody and we're all underneath the pew, then we're not going to worry about the time. Amen? Yeah. We try to be time conscious of your time. We're going to work, getting up to early morning prayer tomorrow, so on and so forth. Turn in your Bibles, please, to the book of Hebrews. I was with Pastor Josh Morocco. He sends his love. I was with, with, uh, with also um, Pastor Robert Sahagon from the island of Molokai, who took my place when I left there 15 years ago. Kind of amazing, and they're having revival there, really. God's breaking out. And uh, I was with... Uh, Brother John Harkey. How many of you know John Harkey? Yeah, we're making plans for him to come back up here. He's been a great joy. Hebrews chapter 12. And then the main text we'll look at is Genesis 4. But let's do uh, Hebrews 12 verse 15. Would you stand up on your feet as is our custom here in honor of the Word of God? And uh, I'm going to read this from the New International uh, version tonight. This is he- Hebrews chapter 12 and uh, verse 15. Uh, is that the Dream Center? The, the whole Dream Center here? Yeah? What's up? You guys rock. Love you. We're so blessed to have you tonight. Wonderful. Oh, oh, and the girls. Come on, somebody say praise the Lord. I like to call you guys the dream team. Hebrews 12 verse 15. You ready? See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Heavenly Father, thank you for what you did and just a few weeks ago when we looked at this text. And now what you will do in the, in the time that remains in this service tonight. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would come and that you, even as we use pen and paper to take notes, you would take your very finger and write on the tablets of our heart that we might be forever changed. Holy Spirit, do what you love to do. God, release all that's in your heart towards us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated, and you want to probably go ahead and turn to Genesis now, Genesis 4. The illustration I used in opening a number of weeks ago is the illustration of driving up to my pastor's house. He lives in Maui at about 3,000 feet in elevation. And to drive up there, you have to go through this road, up this road called Olinda Road. Has anybody like mountain driving? You like, you know, small roads? I do. It's fun. It's risky. I enjoy it. And so uh, this is a unique road in that it has hairpin turns all the way up to the top. It's very narrow. About, I mean, if you're driving, you know, an F-350, you should probably trade it in and get a Dodge. But anyway... (laughs) If you're driving a large truck, if you're driving a large truck, I mean, you, it's hard to get by. <laughs> Found on the road, de- road dead. It's hard to get by because it's so narrow. I'm just kidding. Don't get offended. Don't get bitter. Don't get bitter. It's hard to get got by because it's so narrow. And then on top of that, it has, it's a eucalyptus forest. And the roots of these trees go underneath the road, of course and have broken up the asphalt in some spots. And literally, some of the roots that come out of the, of the asphalt in the road are two feet high, three feet high. So, you know, if you're, if you're not careful, I mean, you can, you, can, you can ding your vehicle, or, you know, you just all of a sudden hit this. I mean, you have to go around these roots. And as I was driving up a number of years ago, and I, I preached on this text after, that, after the, having that word from the Lord, it was a picture of roots of bitterness underneath our lives. 
and how they can spring up and defile many, could defile your car in that case. And so we were talking about bitterness. We have to diligently avoid, now do you have notes? Okay, good. You have to diligently avoid allowing bitterness to get in your life. And, and if you love the Lord, then, then you know, and you, you, you've lived a little while, you've had hundreds of opportunities to avoid bitterness. And, and if, you stay, if you stay bitter, then you end up really losing your intimacy with God. You end up losing your vibrancy of heart. You end up losing your prayer life. You end up getting into a place where things can become ho-hum in your Christianity. Let me just tell you that there are forces of darkness that want to try to get you to be reduced to just a person that does religious stuff that has no power. God wants you to walk like a spiritual athlete, the very same things that Jesus did, you can do and better, said the Lord. And there are, th there are assignments, and bitterness is one of the assignments of the enemy to cause you to be defiled. And it can mess up your life. It'll jack you up. It really will. And so I've had lots of opportunities to get bitter. And in those opportunities, with the help of the Lord and the rebuke of my wife and others, you know, you, yeah, thank God you, you, you deal with the bitterness, but here's the thing that can happen for many, is that you can have a residue of bitterness that can settle in your life. Listen, if you have a short fuse, you know what I mean by that? I mean, all, you just blow your stack like at the shortest, you, you need healing. Now, we're called to be diligent in detecting and resisting a root of bitterness in our heart. Can you say amen? And a root of bitterness grows under the surface long before it's detected. It grows under the surface long before it's detected. We're going to look in Genesis chapter 4 and the life of Cain. He had a serious root system of bitterness that ended up in murder. And that's where bitterness goes. Bitterness, when it fully develops, becomes a spirit of murder. A root of bitterness causing trouble. Go on, be diligent. Lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, which is really quite a statement. I mean, the grace of God is... It's the most powerful force in all the universe, or there ever will be, the grace of God. But you can fall short of it through bitterness. You can miss the full, I don't, you say, you can miss heaven? Oh, you can miss heaven. I, that, that's a, I think that's a message or two ago. I preached on it, got a lot of, lot of um, Calvinists kind of irritated at me. You know what I didn't realize? Uh, as I travel, our podcast and our YouTube and the, the, the web stream goes all over the nation. I had pastor pull me aside and say, I just want to thank you so much. I'm like, I've never, you know, what are you talking about? He says, we have church and then we all go home as a family. We sit around the computer and we watch your service. And I have learned and gotten touched. My whole family's gotten touched. The power of God's come down in our home. Come on, somebody say praise the Lord. If you allow for bitterness in your life and you allow for this root system, even, even a, a residue of it, it can spring up and cause all kinds of trouble. Emotional trouble, we talked about this already, physical trouble, relational stress. If you're bitter, you have stress, more stress than you should have in your life from bitterness. And spiritually, it'll cause you difficulties. So I want you to go to, to, uh, to B. Jude warns us to refuse the lifestyle of three types of false leaders, false teachers, pardon me, there's three types of false teachers here in Jude. Look, look with me. Look, turn to Jude. It's only one chapter. Go to, go to verse 4. I, uh, I was a part of a group text, and um, I just I, with some close folks, close family, friends, and stuff like that, and there was a rebuke. Of a, of, a, of a pastor in the group text that hammered him for being a, a false teacher. I can't tell you how I wanted to jump through the phone and just slap everybody because they, they don't know. It, actually, they don't know. So they're just, they're, they're, they're parroting what they heard from somebody else. But there is false teachers. There are. And Jude warns us of that. Look at Jude chapter 4. For certain men have crept in unnoticed. Uh, verse 4, pardon me. Certain men have crept in unnoticed. Let's, if you don't have a Bible, just look at the screen. For certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness. 
There is a false grace teaching that's out there, and, it is, and, it, and it's, it's horrible. Any, any message of God's grace and God's love that allows you to do more sin isn't from God. So that's, that's a great way to measure it. And as you look at it, you're like, oh, then I can actually live more in sin and it's still okay. No, it's not. You, that's the wrong message. Whoever taught you that's not. Okay. Lewdness and deny the Lord, the only Lord God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Go to verse 11. Verse, verse 11 of Jude Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain. They've run greedily into the error of Balaam for profit and have perished in the rebellion of Korah. So there's three types. Leave the scripture up. There's three types of false teachers here. Now, a false teacher isn't somebody that, that, that blows the 16 fundamental truths. That, that, that could be the case, but they might have all of that right. They might have all their doctrine right. They, they, they might teach and preach rightly, but in their heart, things aren't right. In other words, their life doesn't line up with what they're teaching. You can talk about the love of God and being free and, and, and walking in the liberty of Christ and then be a mean cuss and controlling and manipulating. And I'm going to tell you something, something's wrong with you. Forget it. I'm going over here. I'm going to go over here. You guys got scared when I said a mean cuss. I've been in the South. I've been in the South. They say all kinds of stuff like that. I want to hear the funniest one I heard recently. You walk in here so sad, your lower lip hanging so low, you could suck marbles out of a gopher hole. <laughs> I felt the Holy Ghost for a second. So a false teacher isn't somebody that's teaching falsely, although that can be part of the definition. A false, a false teacher can have, have gone the way of Cain. Have, have got, and what about Cain? We're going to look at that. Turn to Genesis chapter 4, but I'll touch these other two here. The error of Balaam. This is just prevalent across Western, Christi Western cultured Christianity. There's all kinds of people that are preaching and teaching and, and doing demonstration of the Spirit in the name of Jesus with a real anointing for money. In other words, they, they do it for money. Now, there's nothing wrong with making your living from the gospel. A, a, a worker is worth his wages. Don't, come on, don't muzzle the ox. I'm not saying that, the, you know, you should just go broke. That's, that's, a, that's, that's stupid too. But if you're doing what you do so you can get money, so that you can get wealthy, that is the wrong spirit. And none of my staff, I'm not here, we're not here for, this is not a job. <laughs> if it was a job, I'd have quit a long time ago. I'd have just got another job. Sell cars. Do something. No, it's a calling. But there's people that actually do this. You know, Balaam, you remember Balaam? He's the guy that the donkey talked to. Do you remember him? Do you remember him? Okay, and then uh, those who perished in the rebellion of Quran. There are those who were not submitted to authority. They don't submit to authority, and they're, they're, they, they, they want to do it their own way. They want to light their own fire. Man, I, I can't tell you, I was in a call-out room. I was prophesying, prophesying over some people. And uh, if this rebukes you, then praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen? And this guy comes up, and I prophesy over him. And, you know, sometimes when you prophesy over somebody, that it's like, you know, they, they get touched. or like, oh, my gosh, that's the Lord. This, in this case, it was like, you know... It didn't look like the needle moved, and you just, you know, we all like to see a demonstration of some kind of affirmation, like, oh, that was God, you know, but there's just blank. So, you know, I finished, I'm like, amen. Okay, praise God, next. So, you know, we go on to the next person, and uh, he goes off to his seat, but as he was leaving, he said something about, in the course of our interaction, he talked about going to church where we were at that church, Bob Rogers Church, and then as he was leaving, he was talking about going to his other church. And as he walked off, and I went to go prophesy to somebody else, it was like something just turned in me. And I said, uh, what? <laughs> and I called him back. I said, can you, I don't understand what you just said. So he says, well, this is my church. I've gone to church here for 29 years. I said, well, that's awesome. He said, but I go to another church. I said, I'm sorry, are we speaking English? Is it English, right? This is your church you go here for 29 years, but you go to another church. I said, I don't understand that. Can you explain that to me? And he began to explain it to me. He began to explain about how he's here in this church, but he goes to another church because he's received as a prophet. The other church. 
Okay, so I just said, well, let me rebuke you. And then after I rebuke you, we should probably talk later. And so I lovingly, in front of God and country, corrected him and said, dude, pick one. Don't, 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 don't play the harlot. Now, I'm all, I don't think there's anything wrong with going and visiting a church. I don't think there's anything wrong with going to a special guest speaker. I do think there's something wrong with bouncing around and being uncommitted. It's, it's a spirit of adultery is what it is to me. If you're offended right now, just let the Lord heal you. Amen. My wife's looking at me. Be nice. Yes, statesman. I talked with him after, and he explained to me over the course of time he had gotten offended at the church that he's a part of for 29 years because he would prophesy stuff, and they didn't like it. That they didn't like it, and he would be corrected, and so the correction then drove him to go prophesy somewhere else. And I said, well, what, what didn't they like? They just didn't like the word of the Lord. The Lord brought me to bring judgment and to speak judgment. I said, no, you're, you're messed up, dude. Prophecy encourages, strengthens, and comforts. There are times of judgment. And, and, and by the way, I'm leery of anybody that comes up and says, hi, I'm a prophet. I'm checking them off right away. Just immediately when somebody says, I'm a prophet, I go, next? I'm exaggerating a little bit. Listen, let somebody else call you a prophet. Don't go out and get some, some business cards. I'm just walking in humility. Anyway, this guy, he wanted, he wanted to do things his own way. He wanted to do things with his own structure. He wanted to have church the way he wanted to have church. He wanted everybody to hear the word, the, what, the word that he wanted to bring, not under the submission of the pastor. And the prophetic is, is in submission. You have to weigh it. It's got to be under authority. Korah's rebellion is a picture of people. And this is, this is New Testament. It's a picture of people that just want to do it my way. I did it. My, that's the stupidest song I've ever heard. <laughs> Listen, you, we must insist on Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And he has, it's his way or the highway. The highway, you know, highway to hell. Or the highway of holiness. You get to pick it. So there's three, they do, they're talking about three types of false teachers. Are you all there in Genesis chapter 4? Very good. So in Genesis chapter 4, we find a scripture that I required my children to memorize. Find verse um, 2. And then I'll, I'll tell you the part I required them to memorize. It would be, do you well to memorize it also. Later she gave birth to his brother Abel. Abel kept flocks. Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering. As a what? As an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock, which tells you that something died. Come on, are you hunters out there? Some of the firstborn of his flocks, he brings some, she bring, he brings some fat portions. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but Verse 5, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry. He was what? Very angry, and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? And this is what I required them to memorize so many years ago. If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, Sin is crouching at the door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother, Abel, let's go out into the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother, Abel, and killed him. Cain had a tremendous battle with bitterness. And he's bitter, and bitterness is a... Bitterness is a <laughs> in, in this case, he wanted to come to God on his terms. I want to serve God the I want to serve God the way I want to serve God. Well, that's nice. But the Lord is a prescribed way for walking in the blessings of God. It's not just you get to do whatever you want to do, right? Abel worked the herds, Cain with the crops. Cain sought to worship the Lord on his terms instead of God's. Go down to B, trying to review and get to the end of this. Cain's wrong, bitter response to God and Abel is seen in becoming angry and sad. When God told him that his offering was unacceptable, he got angry. 
I know people that are angry because they don't see the full blessing of God in their life. I know people that are frustrated, disappointed, and, you know, I mean, they're, they're just such a sad face. Their lip hangs so low, they could suck marbles out of a gopher hole. <laughs> I know people that are so angry, and they're just, because, because like, God, why won't you accept me? Why? Listen, the Lord accepts you, but he doesn't accept you without the blood of his son. So you can come as much as you want to. You can sit on a pew until you become a pew. That doesn't even smell right, sound right. Oh, you can tithe, you can give, you can feed the, the poor and the hungry, you can lay hands on the sick and see them recover, and he'll say to you, get away from me, I never knew you. You, you, can, you can use the name of Jesus like a lucky charm, like the seven sons of Sceva. You can use the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus has power. You can be the worst sinner. And use the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus has power. Jesus has power. The name of Jesus has power. And so there's people that never will really surrender to the lordship of Jesus Christ, but walk, try to walk in the blessings and not see it fully come and be like, what? Listen, you got to be born again. you got to get saved. Cain wanted to do it his own way. Wait, no, I don't want to tithe. I just want to give 5%. I don't believe in tithing. Well, then you can be busted and broke the rest of your life. And, you know, when you get to heaven and you make it, then, hello. Look at your neighbor and say, it's so wonderful to be in church on Wednesday night. I, I hope he finishes soon. No, don't say that. Don't say that. You know, his, God talked to him and says, it's unacceptable. I, I'm, very, I'm very grateful for the Lord rebuking me and chastising me because it's a sign of sonship. I don't always like it. I, I, I don't always like it. I'm, I, I had some humbling experiences on my trip. You know, it's just great. You just, just eat it. It's like, thank you, Lord. Can I, can I rat myself out? Can I? I'm going to do it anyway, but I'm just saying. Have you, anybody play sports? Okay, you know when you're on, you know when you're in the zone, all right? Can we, can we say that? Like you're in the zone. It's like you can't miss. You just, you, you. okay, that's my favorite kind of preaching. When, when God comes and just comes on me with power and sort of puts me back when he's done. That's my favorite kind. That's not what this is. There's an anointing here, but that's not this. And so I'm preaching at this church, which is a notable church. It's a mega church, a big church. I'm preaching on TV in front of 40 to 60,000 people. That's the coverage of the TV that I was on, TV coverage of the channel. It's approximately, conservatively, how many people watch the program. So I'm wanting God to just come and put gasoline from heaven all over me and set me, <laughs> set me on fire. <laughs> Miracles and signs and wonders and TVs melting at home and people like, oh, the kingdom. And, and honestly, honestly, because I really do long for that, but then, then there's a part of it, there's a part of it that, that, that wants as a part of my ego. And I know I'm aware of that. Don't look at me like that. Oh, you water walker, you. Oh, we all have to battle ego. We all have to battle our pride. And so as it's coming up, I'm like, I bind you now in Jesus' name. And bring it, God. Bring it. Oh, yes, God. Okay. So the first service is not on TV. It's kind of like. Second service. I'm figuring I'm walking in it now. No, I, got, I got the fire now, you know. And it was like somebody turned off the valve. And I'm not sure anybody else knew, but I knew I wasn't in the zone. Okay, it was a good word, I think, maybe a hope, Amen. Right? I mean, you preach God's word, it's God's word, give God results, he'll do the results. But you know, we want to do our best. But, but then you have to fight your ego and fight your pride. And so as I, as I got out to crack that ball in the second service, she was just sort of kind of like, bunt. <laughs> you know, I don't want to bunt, I want to break the cover off the ball. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? 
And so I, you know, I, afterwards, you know, kind of, we call it the post-preaching demon. It's really not a demon, but you know, just getting like, oh, God. And so I just kind of got alone. I was like, Lord. And the Lord is like, did you preach what I told you to preach? Yeah. Well, then just relax. You just wanted to melt TVs. I didn't want to use you to melt TVs today. Well, why not? <laughs> Listen, God has a way of doing things. You have to trust him, trust his leadership. And bitterness can happen when you don't feel like you got paid enough for the work that you did. People fall into bitterness usually because they feel either overlooked, they don't feel appreciated, they feel misunderstood, mistreated, related to money, related to honor. And, and I think we've all been through that. But you have to, you have to, you have to get, pull those roots out and you got to cut them off and you got to hem that, those thoughts in. Because if you don't, it's going to defile you and rob your relationship with Jesus. God sought to help Cain. We're, we really hear this pastoral conversation between God and Cain. Now, he says, now listen, yeah, why, you know, if you do what's right, I'm going to bless you and I'm going to accept you. If you don't do what's right, then I can't, I can't bless you. God's a, it's a picture of justice. Listen, God is a God of justice. He accepts you based on the death of his son, Jesus Christ. That's why he accepts you. Not because you're handsome. Not because you're educated. Not because you have a pair of Jordans on tonight. Not because you gave. Not because you fasted. None of that stuff. You know, legalism does all the stuff that, that, that real pure Christianity does, but it does it for the wrong reasons. Legalism does it to get favor. And, and really, heart Christianity Love Christianity, intimate Christianity related to our Savior does the same things, fasting, praying, giving, sacrificing, but it does it out of a love, not to earn anything. It does it from the fact that you already have it. Legalism does it the other way. So you could earn more love. I could just read the Bible more, and then God's going to love me. That's not true. God loves you just the same. And you'll feel like maybe he loves you more, but that's, that's the love of the world. That's not the love of God. Um, that was bonus right there. He asked Cain two questions, why are you angry? And let me ask you, if you're angry, that's a great question to ask. Why are you angry? Answer the question in detail. If you have an anger problem, find out why you have an anger problem. And I'll promise you that you're going to find, I don't mean a righteous indignation, and as I said in the, uh, the other day, I don't think man can have righteous indignation because the second you get a hold of it, you would make it fleshly. <laughs> Although we can be... Righteous indignation. God has righteous indignation. We can be upset over things that are not righteous. You just have to be in your anger. It's not sin to be angry. In your anger, don't sin. You put a limit on your anger. So we ask them, why are you angry? And if you're struggling with anger, you're struggling with, with bitter, ask God why. And you might find it going all the way down to you and your relationship with your father. You might find it, that root system go all the way back to the relationship with your mother. You might find it going all the way back to that knuckle-headed ex-husband of yours that needed deliverance. You might find that wound going all the way back to a brother or a sister who did things wrong to you and you've never really been able to process that. You've got to let it go. You've got to forgive and you've got to stay grateful because if you don't, you're going to end up having this root system to just prize your heart up. And before you know it, you're going to end up with a spirit of murder. Now, may that not be so, but listen, bitterness unchecked and not dealt with ends up murder. Jesus talks about that, and, and we're hoping to get there here in a little minute. The second question he asked, Cain was sad or, or disappointed and filled with self-pity. Why are you wallowing? What is the matter? Why are you sucking marbles out of gopher holes? What's going on? It's a great question to ask. You know, whenever the Lord asks you something... How many of you know God knows the answer to every question that he asks you? So if he says, what are you doing? How many of you know God knows what you're doing? So he's asking you to elicit a response from you so you would check so that you would know. Adam! Adam, where are you? Do you think God lost Adam? God didn't lose Adam. He's saying, Adam! Adam! Where are you? Oh, Adam didn't know where he was. So he's giving him an opportunity for repentance. Really, it's like, Adam, where are you? And he'd be like, hey, God, I, I, 
I did the wrong thing. And I, and she gave me, I hate it. And I don't, I, right? So when God asks you a question, he's trying to get to something deeper on the inside of you. And I, I'm reminded, I might not finish, so just enjoy it. I, I'm reminded when I, when I got our house a number of years ago, I, I was telling people, oh, I'm 40-something, and, and I finally got my first house. And I, I said it probably 10 times. I'm awakened at th- in 3 in the morning by the Lord on Saturday morning, 3 in the morning. And I hear, I hear the Lord saying, you're 40-something. I forget. How old was I? Let's go ahead and get it right. You're 47, and you finally got your first house. That's what I was saying. I was saying to people, now I'm 47, I got my first house, praise God. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. Okay, so I'd said it a number of times, and I wake up to the Lord saying, so you're 47, and you finally got your first house. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I'm sitting up now, God's presence in my room. There I'm sitting. You know, you're 47, and you finally got your first house. I'm like, right, what are you, what are you saying, God? <laughs> And he says this. Was I not able to give you a house before you were 47? Oh, no, 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 yeah, yeah, you could have. So are you saying that my timing is wrong in the receiving of your house at 47 years old? I know. Yeah, maybe maybe I was kind of saying that could have been a little bit sooner, you know. I mean, I'm happy I got my house, but I like would have like 37 or 27 would have been better. I mean, I know that my other friends have houses at 27. In fact, I have be three or four houses, and I have another friend. <laughs> See, because in my mind, I'm thinking, man, the Lord, why didn't you hook me up before I was 47? And I realized in my heart there was a place of bitterness that God, God hadn't done some certain things for me that I thought he should have done years before. And here I am on my bed, Saturday morning, got to preach some other message that got thrown out and I preached something like this. And I just said, oh, oh God, forgive me. Lord, forgive me. You know, in one moment, God could do for you, but if your attitude's not right, you ain't getting nothing. You can limit the release of God's blessing or you can, or you can release them. Listen, gratitude, you got to, come on, we got Thanksgiving coming up. I'm going to preach on that on Sunday. I'm being grateful. Listen, be grateful. Being, having a heart of gratitude will destroy bitterness. Quit belly aching and, and, and complaining about all the wind and the waves and oh, oh, and my, that other guy, he makes more than me and I've been here before him. I work twice as good. They even knew what I did. Listen, you're working under the Lord, aren't you? And, and, and furthermore, <laughs> furthermore, you're working for a crown that's not even here. Come on, you're, you're supposed to be, we're supposed to be living for another age. Listen, if you find yourself getting so bent up and bowed up because Brother Wonderful or Sister Talk a lot did something to you, then, then maybe you're rooted in the wrong place. Maybe you're not rooted and grounded in the Word. Maybe you've got some issues in your own heart. Maybe you've got some bitterness with your daddy or your mommy or something, and you're so angry at, you're so angry that you can't receive the correction of your, of your small group leader or your pastor or the minister that's over you, and you're just angry and irritated when really you're the one with the problem. All right, I'm almost done. Just lift your hands and be refreshed. Thank you, Lord. It's 8.31. There's nothing on TV. Your children are in a place of safety in the bag. Come on, lift your hands to heaven. I really want to finish this. Long way to go. Minister Mike is going to help me on the keys. Let's just, let's just crack this a little bit. Go to, uh, in your notes somewhere. I think it's F. God spoke four principles to Cain. 
to work through based on how he answered the two questions. Principle one, if you do well, will you not be accepted? So if you do the right thing according to the word of God, listen, you're accepted because of the blood of Jesus. This is for somebody. Your weakness, God doesn't, God doesn't look, down his, look down his nose at you and get all angry at you because you're weak. Even in our weakness, God, God's, God's pleased with us. He still loves us. Weakness is not rebellion or wicked. Weakness is not wickedness. Ooh, ooh, I feel something right there. We might not finish now. I don't know. But if you continue to yield to your weakness, it can become weakness. You see, if, if you're finding yourself being corrected for being a fornicator, you know, you get all angry because... You just, you know, it's your body and you can do what you want to. Well, if you're saved, you're born again, it's not your body. So it's not. And you say, well, I'm just going to go out and have one more if I have a weakness. And you begin to think. You, it, there's nothing wrong with thinking a thought that's wrong. Let me say that different. Thinking wrong thoughts, they come, but you have to take, take, take them captive. You have to cast them down. If you allow them to think, you allow those thoughts to continue to roll in your mind. It's T minus 10, T minus 9. T minus. You continue to think that, you'll be doing it very shortly. James talks about that, right? This is where sin starts, the battlefield of the mind, as, as one great preacher, what's her name? Joyce Myers talks about. But if you yield to that weakness, like uh, there's somebody here, and you're just like, man, I'm just going to go, to, I'm just going to take just one, just one more, one more fling. Um, Oh, I, I've, heard, I've, heard, I've heard of people that get so bitter and be like, I'm working, I'm serving, and man, I didn't see the breakthrough. I'm just going to do something for myself. That is the most insane thing I've ever heard about. Then they go out and they do some sin, not realizing or not understanding that in their, their spiritual insanity of going out to have a fling, they end up with like three or four more demon spirits manipulating them and don't even know that that time might be the last time that their heart really surrenders to the Lord. See, you've got to get rid of bitterness. And you and, and if you don't like the way God's doing it, just repent. Trust him. You're the clay. He's the potter. Trust him. Trust him. I mean, some people think they should have a worldwide history changing ministry by now. And, you know, you don't just yet as far as you can tell. And I'm going to say that as far as you can tell. I am amazed as I've been serving the Lord for a couple decades now at the fruit that comes back. I, I, I mean, you know, you said something. You prayed for somebody and you're like, whatever. Whatever. Because nothing happened. You know, we want it now. Press the, the microwave popcorn, get the popcorn, eat the popcorn. We want it now. I mean, I'm amazed that 10 years later, the fruit that comes. I had somebody text me today. They were just as lost as a goose in a hailstorm. And, and they're so on fire. And they, they, they wanted to know what I was preaching because they're preaching tonight too. They were, they, were, they were one of those, what the world would say is a hopeless case. Listen, you got to deal with bitterness. And if you do the right thing, you'll be accepted. Principle two, if you don't do well, sin lies at the door. Sin lies at the door. Like a lion, a roaring lion. Look at principle three. Sin desires you. Satan wants in your weakness to escalate to wickedness. That's what he wants to have happen. So if you're feeling weak, well, welcome to the human race. Get prayed up. Come on, get some accountability. Come on, rebuke those thoughts. Hem them in, tear them down, root them out. Principle four. You're responsible to rule over it. Now, what I like about this, this is the Old Testament. So he's talking to Cain, and he's saying, Cain, you can rule over sin. And now, if Cain could rule over sin without the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, I think probably you can. God makes a way of escape for you, makes a way of escape. No temptation has seized you except that which is common to man. God always makes a way of escape. Early on in my walk, as I started figuring this out, I'd be so tempted to go do something. I'd be like, where's the escape? And the Lord would be like, it's right there. I'm like, okay. Cain talked with Abel. Cain talked with Abel instead of God. Listen, if you're bitter and you're angry with somebody, why don't you resolve it before you go talk to them so you don't get in a fist fight? How about that? That's kind of the way that is. Some of you just want to charge it. You want to, you're, you know, you're like, everybody gets so angry that, that you just, you know, you can't see straight. Yeah, that's not the time. You know, that, that, that's not the time to bring correction to your child. No, they need it right then. No, 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 no. If you can't control yourself after your kid has just done some foolish, rebel, kids do foolishness, right? You train that. 
Rebellion is, is chastisement. Hello. Very good. I got one amen from the man in the back who probably has about 10 kids. Praise the Lord. All right, wherever you are. If your child does something and you're just like, boot, I mean, it's just like, it's like oh, you want to come out and just, just lord over them and hammer them. Wait. Count to 10. And then just say, there's going to be some consequences for that, but not right now. No, 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 not right now. Not right now. You'll get yourself together. Come back and give proper consequences. But don't, don't, don't in your anger and in your bitterness, go deal with your boss. Am I, am I the only one that's ever done something stupid like that? Oh, that's it. You're going to hear it from me. Oh, no, I haven't got it. No, no, no. Go pray through. Go into the toilet. Go, not the toilet, the bathroom. Go into the bathroom. Go into the bathroom and turn that thing into a cathedral and get the peace of God that passes all understanding before you go wreck your job. When your anger's really not over your boss, it's really over your dad. So get, get the root out. All right, I gotta hurry up. I'm almost done. It's 8.37 or so. Okay, Cain didn't understand the consequences of his actions. And I will tell you that if you don't deal with your bitterness, the consequences of your actions are going to be vast. Cain said, where is your brother Abel? Do you think God knows where Abel is? Yeah, he knows. He's giving an opportunity to repent again. Am I my brother's keeper? What a wisecracker. Where is Abel? The consequences of your action on others. Some of you don't realize that your bitterness and your anger has, has, has playing a role. Some of you, oh, thank you. Some of you are printing. You're printing your children with it. It's, you're, 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 you're printing them. You're, you're patterning them. You're patterning them for upset and for bitterness. Listen, don't talk about other people. And, and listen, if you don't like my preacher, you don't like me, go to another church. But furthermore, don't talk about, did I say that? I, I just said that. Don't, don't talk stink about me to your kids because let me just tell you why. I'm not perfect and I repent for my errors and I try to be sweet and filled with the love of God. I really do. I live right. But if you undermine spiritual leadership, your kids will hate church. So if you're really upset about something, just call, let's resolve it. Don't, don't bellyache to your kids about your youth pastor or about, you know, about uh, whatever, about your boss. Because then, then they'll have bitterness and rebellion towards authority. And when they grow up, they're not going to church. They're not, they're going to have the same spirit that you have, but it's going to be worse. Come on, you got to deal with it. What have you done? What are the consequences to your life? All right, God is speaking to us very simply. Turn to Matthew 5. I've got to wrap it up. I didn't like the way I just said that. I grieved myself, grieved the Holy Ghost. Forgive me. You know, when I said, if you don't like me, go somewhere else. I mean, you know, you should love your pastor and you should love where you're going to church and get fed. So it's true, but it's just not very nice. Sorry. Okay, Matthew 5. Amen. <laughs> I'm forgiven. I receive it. Praise God. <laughs> oh, some of you drag stuff on. Oh, you know what? That's good. Some of you will drag stuff on all day. All day. Oh, no. Can you believe it? Huh. Hmm. And listen, if you repent, it's over. It's under the blood. Unless you want to bring the blood of Jesus on trial. Some of you just beat yourself up for stuff. Stop. Stop. Truly repent. Let it, let it, let it go. Matthew 5, 21, you've heard, put it up, Matthew 5, 21, please. You've heard that it was said to people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders shall be subject to the judgment. Go ahead, next verse. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother or sister will be subject to the judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother or sister, Raka, is answer answerable to the court. Anyone who says you fool be in danger of hell fire. You see, if you don't deal with, this is what it's saying very simply without going too deep because I'm out of time. If you don't deal with bitterness, you don't deal with your anger problem, then it, like dominoes, 
can become worse and worse and worse, and you can actually end up with, hey, listen, some of the shootings and things that have taken place, you, you study the lives of these people that are totally demonized, that have killed people. You, you study, they, they've been wounded, they're rejected, they're hurting, nobody, you know, I, they've just got a whole pile of a giant root system of bitterness and hatred that turned into murder. Refuse the bitter root road. Oh, go, go to verse, go to, go to Matthew 5, 25. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who's talking with you, who's taking you to court, pardon me. Do it while you're still together on the way. Or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you'll be thrown into the prison. Listen, there's, a, there's your, your heart. You, you, you put your heart in a spiritual prison if you don't deal with your bitterness. Stop. Stop. God's seen everything. He knows everything. He knows how to straighten. He knows how to correct the record. He knows how to set the record straight. He does. And we so many times want to set it straight or fix their wagon or get more money or get more honor or whatever. When Listen, God knows how to do it for you. Refuse to get bitter. One more scripture. Turn to 1 John 3. I don't know if I finished your notes. I've got pages left. But let's, just, let's just do 1 John 3, 11. Let me read this to you. But this is a message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Next verse. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Next verse. Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. Keep going. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. We should read this again before we go to verse 15. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Now, how do we know what love is? That one man crucified, one man laid down his life for another. That's what love is. Go, go read 1 Corinthians 13. That's love. Love's not lust. That's, that's, that's not what love is, right? Okay. Because we love anyone who does not love remains in death. Verse 15. Anyone who hates his brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. Well, let's close in prayer. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Stand up on your feet all across this place. Very simply tonight, before we close just a few more moments in the service and we'll be done. If you're struggling with bitterness, you need to get it out of your life. You say, how's that? Well, repent. Be prayed for. And let God heal you. And, and, and trust His Lordship. Trust that He knows how to... Say. Listen, when it's all said and done, when it's all over, when it's over and you're there, just you, standing before the throne, to give an account for every word, for every action, to receive rewards and to suffer loss. Every one of us called the judgment seat of the believer. And when you stand there, is holding on to your bitterness now worth the loss that you'll experience? Listen, you've gonna, you're gonna have it pretty good. I mean, it might be difficult right now, but listen, you're gonna get a house. You get a glorified body. Come on. And the weather's always nice. The food is amazing. You get, you get to judge angels and be used by the Lord. You, you get to dwell forever in magnified glory with the angels. And oh, for billions and billions for eternity. You get to God, would, it, would it not be worth it just to let go of the little bitterness right now, the little thing that you feel? Why don't you just put that down? Why don't you just let that go and enter into all that He has for you now? Pass the test. The, 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 the test that you're going through is working for you a far exceeding weight of glory if you'll allow for God to process you through it. Come on, don't be weary in well-doing for in due time. Don't get bitter. Due time, you'll receive a... 
harvest. If you're struggling with bitterness, you're struggling with anger, you know this message is for you. Quickly get out of your seat, come to the front. Come quickly, come. Come all the way up to the stairs and lift your hands. Lord, in the name of Jesus. just listen to this incredible hypocrisy that we live at times. You're so mad and so bitter at somebody for the fact that they didn't do something. But look at what you did and God forgave you. I mean, can you believe the likes of us? We did the things that we've done the way that we think, oh, oh, I can't believe. Look at what you did. Listen, you need to let them go. You need to forgive them. I ministered to dozens of people who had broken hearts from their homes. And, and one of the recurring words was, you can't, your parents couldn't give you what they didn't have. How do you give something, something you don't have? So let them off the chain. They'll stand before the Lord. Your bitterness and your anger is not going to set the record straight. It's going to poison you, give you bad health, destroy your relationship with Jesus. How about just forgive them? And, and why don't you walk like Jesus? Why don't you talk like the Lord? Why don't we act like, come on, let us be the model to the a lost and a dying and a hurting world. And then God will reward you and God will bless you and He'll pour out His Spirit on you and you'll live with this vibrancy. Yeah, I gotta talk, I gotta go back to my story with this lady from Western or Eastern Kentucky, wherever she was from. As I walked out of that experience, I realized that I had been in a cloud of God's presence and power for three plus hours. And I asked the Lord about it. And I really, I did have to check to see if she was an angel, I wasn't sure. And the Lord spoke to me so simply. He says, you were just being kind. And when you're kind and you do the Sermon on the Mount, it releases my power. So do more of that, son. I thought, okay. Let's, let's, let's be kind. Why don't you just be sweet to people? Why don't you just, just, just love people? Forgive them. Come on, Minister Micah. Holy Spirit. Come on, pastors, ministers, just touch and agree. Touch and move. Touch and move. Touch and agree. Right now in the name of Jesus. Let your power come. Holy 
trust you as our heavenly father to bring the honor to to reward us not for our ego's sake not so that we can trumpet it around and show off Lord all we want is really just to be satisfied and walking with you talking with you having a right relationship with you being used to fulfill the mandate that you've given us to us, to reach souls, to reach the nations, and to hear in the end, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Lord, that's, a, that's more than enough for us. Take any striving out of us. Take out, take out any place in us that, that's out of joint. Lord, expose any stronghold, any way of thinking that's contrary to truth. We want to rightly represent you, and we want to love each other, for you will know them by their love for one another. Forgive us for cold love. Forgive us for where we didn't care for the loss or the hurting or the broken, the halt, the withered, the lame. Forgive us for where we crossed to the other side, and we're not like the Good Samaritan. Lord, open our eyes to a lost and a hurting, broken world. Let us reach people, Lord. Let us help people. Oh, God, thank you. With every head bowed, every eye closed, if you're not right with God, don't leave this place in the closing moments. Now, give your heart to Jesus. If that's you, pray this prayer right out loud. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your Son, Jesus, to die in my place. Forgive me of all of my sin. And just as Jesus rose again from the grave, raise my life up and use me for the purpose for which I was created. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for hearing my prayer. Amen. Let me pray for you and then we'll close. Holy Spirit, I pray. Touch, fill, heal. Oh, just for a moment. Come on, three minutes and service is over. Come on, just lift your voice and pray in your heavenly language or sing in your heavenly language tonight. If you've not been filled with the Spirit, just lift your heart to the Lord. Open your mouth, let Him fill you. You need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You need the fire. You need the power of God. Holy Spirit, come fill. Be filled tonight. Be filled tonight. Be filled tonight, right now. In Jesus' name. God, we give you praise. We give you glory. We give you honor. We love you, Jesus. Pray with me, our Father, 
one all together, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. In Jesus' name, come on, someone say amen. May the Lord bless you, keep you, cause his face to shine upon you. May he lift up his countenance towards you, be gracious to you and give you peace. God bless you. Praise the Lord.